Okay, there you go. Um, urbanization in Asia has exploded in the last 20 years, and this trend, we strongly believe, will continue for the next 20 to 30 years. So as more cities, small, medium, big, mega cities in Asia continue to grow, it comes with a lot of challenges and problems. Finance, which is the topic for this morning, is definitely one very important area that um, uh, we are paying attention. But at the same time, we think there are, there are more that uh, a development bank like ADB would need to do. So in Asia, in the ADB, our focus are in supporting our developing member countries, cities, growing rapid, rapidly growing cities, is through our urban uh, operational plan. This is a plan approved by president in 2011, and it will go all the way to 2020. The aim of that plan is for us, for the bank to support developing countries in Asia, to help them to do better urban planning, to help them to um, uh, improve the capacity of local government, and importantly, is to design and uh, develop and package bankable projects that we can invest or we can invite private sector to come and work with us to help cities um, develop. The ultimate goal uh, is to make Asian cities green, inclusive, and competitive, with a focus, of course, on the environment, which you all know, environment is a big problem in Asia, to make them more inclusive through better social equity, and importantly, to be more competitive by improving the economy. And this is uh, very much in line with the recently uh, approved um, uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 11 to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So how do we do that? Uh, sorry, this page is not moving. We have, we do it mostly through three mechanisms. These are mostly financing mechanisms, but it is a bit more than just financing, as I've just said. We think financing is one aspect, it's very important, but cities need more than just finance to help them get more finance. So traditionally, so in ADB we have the, of our traditional sovereign loans, then we are now increasing our private sector financing through a private sector department, but importantly is what we call in ADB finance plus plus, and I'll explain all of them uh, uh, separately one at a time, Subsequent, in subsequent slides. First of all, our sovereign loans. So generally in ADB, we provide loans through the central government to cities who would need uh, to build infrastructure or basic services. Um, but we find over the years that by just giving them a loan to do a project that they want is not enough. So we have been very hard trying to work with our partners and we have been very lucky to be cooperating with a number of partners to add something before we even provide the loan to these cities. So first of all is uh, through a number of initiatives. One is the City Development Initiative of Asia is an initiative uh, started by ADB and the uh, government of uh, Ger uh, Germany um, to provide funding, these are grant funds, to work with cities to help them develop urban assessment, uh, national urban assessment or city level strategies, and also to do pre-feasibility studies. With that, then we can better package and design the project. And two years ago, we have also um, got uh, agreement and support from the UK DFID uh, and Rockefeller Foundation, as well as USAID, to uh, create a fund called the Urban Climate Change Resilient Trust Fund. This is a 140 million trust fund. Again, it's a grant that we will provide to cities that we are working with to help them design, or incorporate climate resilient features into their project. With that, uh, we are able to make most of the projects or, uh, 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 and program that we are working with in the city level much more attractive and much more bankable. And importantly, for the Climate Change Fund, for the Climate uh, Resilient Trust Fund, is we are able to help cities design projects that they will be able to tap into uh, the new Climate Change Fund, which is not an easy task, but we think with that, with our, with our help of working together, got the cities, got, city government would be able to tap into those funds a little easier and a little bit better. So as, as an example I want to show is, is, uh, is in Pakistan. We have recently approved a, a project in Pakistan, in Punjab. This is a project covering two cities, the cities of Siakaut 
and uh, Sahiwa in the Pakistan. With the CDIA, the City Development Initiative of Asia, um, we provided uh, uh, funding to help them prepare climate resilient medium term infrastructure investment program and also pre feasibility work on selected priority urban infrastructure projects. After that, we then ADB come in with our grant fund to help them prepare a project and together with the Urban Climate Resilient Trust Fund, we were able to do further study on climate risk and vulnerability assessment um, and also formulate a draft city development strategy and a five-year medium-term plan. So with all this together, this project is going to be um, implemented very shortly over a five-year period, and we think it would be very important, particularly if you see that these cities are quite close to the coast and climate change features would be extremely important. The next uh, major mechanism, financing mechanism that ADB is pushing and will continue to push, particularly for the next five, 10 years, is our private sector operations. Um, our private sector department, the funds can be directly lent to uh, private companies or state-owned enterprises. So it doesn't need to go through the central government. It's a little easier if city government would work with private companies or their own uh, uh, um, institutions or agencies to um, apply to us or work with us to get funding. There are various ways that the ADB is uh, supporting uh, city development and urban development through the private sector arm. We provide debt and equity investments, uh, mobilize third party capital through credit uh, enhancement products as, uh, as well as risk transfer agreement. And we also invest in private equity and other structured funds. So it's very flexible. There are many ways that uh, our private sector can work with all of you, uh, some of the cities or some of you are companies who may want to support some cities in developing projects, but it has to be in Asia, of course. Uh, so these are the sectors that we are involved in in the private sector. It's a wide range. It's, it's, it's everything you can find or you need in the city. And an example, a recent example that we, our private sector department has supported is an urban project in Yangon City in Myanmar. This is a 120 million loan of complementary financing of loan as well as political risk assessment uh, packages. And the aim is to help the old city of Yangon to increase business and tourism while preserving preserving and protecting this very beautiful uh, old building. This is an old historical building. This is the British Burma Railway Building. And in Yangon, they call it the old lady. And we are trying to help them and improve tourism. And in conjunction with that, we are also helping to uh, support an eight megawatt district cooling system that hopefully would help uh, stimulate uh, tourism business. And this is a project that we, do, we are financing together with two Japanese companies. But I think the third mechanism that we find is most important and I think most more relevant to the discussion today is our so-called finance plus plus. The finance, the first finance is the ADB finance, our regular lending and loans. The second finance is leveraging, is our co-financier, is our partners, bilateral donors, it could be private, it could be public sector, to um, uh, further increase our lending to, to our clients. So over the years, uh, average, in av on average, ADB lend about 12 to 13 billion a year. Of that, I think about 60 to 70 percent are in the urban sector. But we were able to bring in another 7 to 8 billion co-financing from other sources. So in total, we had about 22 billion. As of 2017, our shareholders have given us permission to merge our concessional lending as well, uh, together with our ordinary capital lending so that we can lend more. So as of 2017, we can increase our lending by 50% to an average of about 18 to 20 billion a year, just ADB alone. But at the same time, we want to increase our co-financing, leveraging other funding sources by the same amount. So we're hoping to lend 35 to 40 billion a year starting from 2017. And with that, we believe a big chunk of that would go to supporting cities' development. And we definitely want to work with some of you or all of you here on stage. But the uh, most important plus, the last plus, is knowledge. We believe knowledge is the most important aspect to transform cities. Bringing in finance is important, but without the right, the proper knowledge and setting up the, uh, um, the, the capacity for the local government, it will not work. They will not be sustainable. So in addition to ADB's 
uh, technical assistance. Now, uh, generally, we provide about 300 million a year to, for our pro to prepare our projects, to do a, a range of um, uh, capacity development, policy development, project preparation. Uh, we also tap into bilateral funds, uh, many trust funds that we work with our clients. So we feel that is a very, very important and a very good example of something we would be starting to do and we again hope to work with some of you or all of you is our new Future Cities program. Uh, this is a uh, program in which we would focus on supporting eight cities in Asia to make them inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And we will be starting with integrated planning supporting them to rapid urban, to, um, to support their, uh, manage their urban growth, to make them more livable. But importantly, with this uh, program, we want to uh, partner with centers of excellence to provide best practice knowledge. I was walking around the uh, venue yesterday and today, there are so many you know, great examples and so many of you that we think we want to partner with you to bring all that knowledge to our client and this would be brilliant. So this particular program is very interesting, is unlike our normal uh, studies uh, support, normally we go, we support, we do a study for about a year and then we leave. For this particular program, we plan to stay with these cities over the long term, 15 to 20 years. We want to see the city actually be transformed over those, that time to be livable, to be climate resilient. And we will provide institutional coordination and also provide end-to-end -end solutions, which I saw quite a lot outside. Um, we would then also then help to look for financing. In addition to ADB, we would be happy to look for other investors that can help the cities uh, to grow. So we, th we think by catalyzing partnership, we will be able to support cities to become better, to improve their service delivery and urban management. I know I've used up my time, but I just want to close with one example of a new area that ADB is venturing into. It is not so much focusing on one city. ADB has been working very hard uh, and in a way quite successfully too, in regional cooperation and integration. Nowadays, you know, we are getting global. Countries actually do a lot of work together. They trade together. Right? This regional cooperation with us is, we have been doing that the last 20 years, particularly in the greater Mekong sub-region and now also in Central Asia and South Asia. Is we have built a lot of roads. After we build all these transport corridors, governments are t asking us to, how do we then transform these into economic corridors to be actually economic growth hubs. The next thing immediately they think of are the cities along these transport corridors. So the next wave of urban development that ADB is also uh, going to uh, move into is developing uh, economic hubs along transport corridors. But more importantly is many of our client governments are asking us for support to build cross-border economic zones, border cities, how to make these cities work together as one economic region. Hopefully they will share the same uh, institutional arrangement, same standards, and also better trade. And with that, we think this would be the new area that um, cities would maybe transform into you know, another form that would need to be even smarter uh, and more efficient. So that I hope uh, we would be able to hear from some of you how you think we ADB can work with you to develop more of these cross-border uh, uh, new cities. Thank you. Amy, thank you very much. Okay, can I ask you to don your headsets now and switch to channel three? Uh, for simultaneous translation of the presentation of Mayor Lee, please would you take the podium. Many prepared, and we have a 우리 상남시는 현재 100만 명이 거주하고 있습니다. 
네. 100만 명이 거주하고 있고 약한해 예산은 20억 불 정도 됩니다. 에, 성남시의 한쪽에는 음, 세계 유네스코 어, 지정 문화유산인 남한산성이 이, 위치하고 있습니다. 그리고 어, 도시 한쪽에는 음, 천 개가 넘는 대한민국 최고의 IT, BT 기업들이 어, 연간 600억 달러 정도 규모의 에, 생산을 하고 있는 한국판 실리콘밸리라고 불리는 곳입니다. 에, 우리 성남시에 한때 재정적인 위기가 있었습니다. 그런데 위기는 곧 기회이다 이런 얘기처럼 성남시의 재정위기는 오늘의 성남시의 재정이 아주 탄탄하게 다시 재정비되는 좋은 기회가 됐습니다. 성남시가 과거의 철거문의 도시 또 재정위기의 도시에서 안정적인 그야말로 대한민국 최고의 도시가 된 비결은 뭘까요? 네, 결국은 Back to the Origin 기본과 원칙에 충실한 시정 운영이라고 하겠습니다. 공정성과 투명성을 넘어서는 대안은 없습니다. 정부 운영에 있어서 부정부패, 예산 낭비 이런 걸 철저히 없애고 세금 탈루를 막았습니다. 이게 커다란 효과가 되었습니다. 5년 전 제가 성남시장으로 처음 당선됐을 때 성남시는 시청사 건립, 무리한 인프라 투자, 주택 재개발 등으로 긴급한 부채가 6억 불을 넘겨서 심각한 재정 위기였습니다. 2010년 7월 시장에 취임한 후에 중대한 결단을 내렸습니다. 전체적으로 한꺼번에 갚을 수가 없기 때문에 나누어서 갚을 수밖에 없다라고 하는 모라토리엄 선언을 하고 재정 혁신을 시작했습니다. 첫째로 부정부패를 없애기 위해서 최선을 다했습니다. 한번 비리를 저지르면 공직사회에서 영원히 퇴출시키는 원 스트라이크 아웃 제도를 도입했습니다. 시장실에는 CCTV를 달아서 청탁이 오면 당신의 지금 모습이 녹화된다 이렇게 알려주었습니다. 세금으로 나쁜 짓이나 불필요한 쓸데없는 짓을 할수 없는 구조를 만들었습니다. 두 번째 예산 낭비를 없앴습니다. 어, 대부분의 행사 경비는 거의 삭감했고 어, 보도블록도 재활용하는 등으로 어, 허리띠를 졸라맸습니다. 어, 세 번째 세금 탈루를 철저하게 막았습니다. 세금을 체납한 사람은 대한민국 끝까지 추적하는 추적팀을 만들었습니다. 어, 경찰과 함께 세금 체납자의 집도 압수수색했습니다. 어, 세금을 많이 안낸 사람은 출국 금지도 시켰습니다. 음. 이런 각고의 노력 끝에 3년 6개월이 지난 2014년에는 전체 부채 중에 80%에 해당되는 5억 불을 청산하고 모라토리움을 벗어나서 건전한 재정 상태로 복귀했습니다. 정부가 존재한 이유는 시민 개개인의 최소한의 삶의 조건을 충족하는 것입니다. 무한 경쟁 승자 독식의 비정한 정글 속에 국민을 방치한다면 정부가 존재할 이유가 없습니다. 상남시는 재정 건전화의 바탕 위에 공공성 확대에 주력했습니다. 아, 그런 재정적인 안정화의 바탕 위에서 우리 상남시는 대표적으로 청년층에게 연 900불 규모의 청년 배당을 지급하기로 했습니다. 일종의 기본 소득 개념인데 대한민국 최초로 기본 소득을 공론화하는 계기가 됐습니다. 네, 나머지 부분은 다 생략하고 우리 대한민국에서 하고 있는 에, 스마트 시티에 맞는 에, 사례를 하나 소개해 드리도록 하겠습니다. 에, 에, 이, 요, 준비됐나요? 음. 에, 실제 사례를 하나 보여드리면 에, 상남 시민 한 명이 길을 가다가 네, 훼손된 시설을 발견하고 스마트폰으로 사진을 찍습니다. 저희의 스마트폰으로 트위터를 합니다. 그리고 바로 에, 조치된 결과가 에, 보고됩니다. 아, 성남시 민원을 처리하는데 통상 일주일 걸리던 게단 2시간 만에 다 해결됩니다. 아, 대한민국 국민의 83%가 스마트폰을 사용하기 때문에 아, 소셜미디어 플랫폼을 활용해서 민원 처리 시스템을 갖추었습니다. 음. 대한민국의 
가장 유용한 행정 처리 시스템이 된것 같습니다. 현재 성남시 공직사회에는 143개 부서에 시민소통 전담 요원이 배치돼서 근무 중이고 지금까지 1만 건이 넘는 시민 요구사항을 소셜 플랫폼을 활용해서 해결했습니다. 그래서 시민들의 만족도가 아주 기대 이상이었습니다. 민원 처리 기간이 7일에서 하루 안으로 현격하게 단축됐습니다. 민원의 발생 그리고 결과만이 아니라 민원 접수 확인 처리 결과 통보 사후 관리 등전 과정이 실시간으로 소셜 미디어를 통해서 피드백됩니다. 당연히 성남시 행정 서비스에 대한 신뢰도는 높아졌고 누군가는 이걸 속도가 빠르다고 해서 광속 행정이라고 부르고 있습니다. 소셜 플랫폼 상에서 처리된 모든 민원 처리 사항은 시장에 관심이 없는 시민들에게도 자연스럽게 노출돼서 시정 참여를 유도하게 됐습니다. 소통이 부족할 경우에 불편과 불만으로 이어지고 민원은 중복적으로 발생합니다. 하지만 소셜미디어와 행정서비스의 결합으로 자칫 악화될 수 있는 상황을 사전에 예방하고 시민들과 공감대를 형성할 수 있게 됐습니다. 무엇보다도 시민들의 참여와 소통하는 행정에 대한 긍정적 이미지는 성남시의 위상을 높이는 데 크게 기여를 하고 있습니다. 더 나아가 올해 성남시는 보다 효율적인 시민과의 소통을 위해서 빅데이터 분석과 필터링 기능을 탑재한 소셜 플랫폼 통합 처리 시스템을 구축했습니다. ICT와 행정 서비스의 결합이 새로운 미래 도시의 롤 모델을 앞당기고 있습니다. 신사숙 여러분 성남시의 재정 혁신 비결은 공정성 확대를 원칙으로 공공성을 강화하는 것이었습니다. 또한 소셜미디어를 활용한 시민과의 소통은 성남시의 비전을 구현하는 중요한 역할을 담당했습니다. 불평등의 해소와 공정성의 강화 그리고 소통을 통한 시민주권의 실현은 지방자치시대의 비전입니다. 40년 전 황무지에서 시작해서 이제 대한민국 최고의 복지도시로 성남한 성장한 성남시 우리 성남시는 대한민국을 넘어서 세계적인 모범을 창출하기 위해 끝없이 노력하겠습니다. 성남시의 이러한 도전에 국제적인 연대와 지지를 보내주시고 많은 관심과 함께 조언도 부탁드립니다. 경청해 주신 데 대해서 감사합니다. 아주 짧게 축약해서 제 발표를 마치겠습니다. 땡큐. 감사합니다. Thank you, Mayor Lee, for those remarks and an insight into developments in your city, which I hope someday to go and visit. The pictures look fantastic. We are just going to swap over a little bit of the technology. Um, you can remove your headsets if you haven't already, because we'll now be returning to English. And I'd like to welcome, please, to the platform, Mr. Su, who will move now from an Asia perspective into Africa. Mr. Su. Good morning. Well, a city is about all this, all of it. And more and more, there seem to be, uh, especially in Africa, that infrastructure is becoming a market, a market that in attracts and interests both private sector and public sector. Uh, my paper will, will look at various experience in different cities, some in Africa. I was saying to you that not only it, it's, it's a global market, but also most of the development in, in, in the world in, in major infrastructure area concern the developed world and the new emerging market is the tropical world, which is 110 countries out of 200 countries in the world. And today, all these countries have had their infrastructure not replaced, not maintained since their independence, which is about 50 years ago. 
And on top of it, it has been aggravated by the demography and also by influx of population from the rural areas to the cities. So it's becoming a huge market and in Africa, in Africa it's also uh, an infrastructure that has been built from inside to outside. That is, the, the, all the roads, all the rails, all the, the infrastructure takes goods from the inside of the country to the coast and then to the rest of the original Mother England or Mother France or Mother Portugal. But they don't communicate and they are not connected between themselves. So today it's a different way and, and probably we will have to look at that in a different way. So three points I would like to mention to you about all, all the approach to infrastructure. One, to achieve smart growth. Two, is to do more with less, and free, which is not easy, to win support for this change. To achieve smart growth, all cities need economic growth, either to, for their citizens to just earn a living or to enjoy a good quality of life. And smart growth is to find the best way to do it sustainably. And a great strategy would be to identify, attract the best growth prospect. Two areas we should be looking at. One is the competitive advantage of each city. Each city is different and they do have one. Dubai, for example, is a, uh, looks at its port, has built a great port. And th with this offer, they can attract talent and attract all the business resources to make the city uh, much better and competing in, in the whole world. We have to determine what the city is known to be, is to be known for and make this as a business offer and treat it as a client. Uh, another critical element is to plan for change and success, successful cities anticipate how growth will change will influence the, the needs of the city. We have to have an environmental management uh, agenda, regulations, zoning laws, market mechanism, incentives, and to set the goal and standards. It, it is much better and cheaper to deal with all the green issues early, air quality, land use, before they become problems and expense and they, they are really expensive remedial action to fix the problem themselves. Traffic is another issue which you know can really kill the economy of the city. To do more with less, no single city anywhere in the world have enough money to do what they want to do, what they want to accomplish. Cost efficiency is very important. High performance city assess, manage all their expenses well, and more and more they outsource administration to lower cost centers. They, they have strategic procurement, zero-based budget. They, they find partnership with private sector. Great city leaders accept that they, not every single service of the city needs to be provided directly by government. They acknowledge that the government mandate has to change also over time, but many, very often in many cities, especially in Africa, the authorities are very worried to give up control of, to the private sector in some specific uh, sectors. But private sector and good partnership can deliver uh, good infrastructure and services at lower cost and higher uh, quality. The key is to define goals, measurable goals, and cost-benefit analysis and rigorous performance metrics. Sorry, I didn't move these for you. Good governance. Regardless of how, where the money is coming from, there is no substitute for good governance and investment 
accountability. In some countries, 50% of the electricity is lost in transmission or water in distribution. Sometimes it's cheaper to manage that than to build new, new plants and new uh, power plants. And it, uh, McKinsey uh, estimates that $400 billion per annum is sa could be saved by just speeding up permitting, structuring projects differently to encourage time and cost savings. Technology can also be um, a game changer because the right data today with IT can be analyzed to help to help to increase revenue, identify appropriate and timely decisions, lower capital spending, and improve services. Some cities adjust sensors for street lighting, garbage collection for, for uh, to optimize their their, their lorries uh, collection, and also better time management, less fuel and congestion. The other point, the last point, which is not. It's it, much easier said than done is to win support for change. Statue quo is always a situation where established business, communities, political interests, they all prefer to maintain. And sometimes they even fiercely defend it. But city leaders need to be persistent and resilient if they want to deliver fast, positive, and visible result. They, then they can build support for more change. Singapore, for, but, but these you need high performing civil servant. And Singapore, for example, uh, is one of the most highly regarded civil services. They benchmark their public sector against private sector pay so that they can keep and, and, and their best talent to work with them. And outstanding city leaders have a coherent vision. Not only an idea of where they want to go, but also how their history can inform that journey. They build on, 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 on their values and knowledge and to inspire their constituencies. The vision can be and must be personal. Some mayors are very committed and even passionate about, about their vision and where they want to take their people uh, in, in their cities. But you have to have quick wins, otherwise this will not have support. And, and, and some uh, like Jaime Lerner in Curitiba had his, his pilot project about transport rapid bus tra system to demonstrate early success, soften opposition, and work out any difficulties. And finally, cities are essential to global economic growth and productivity. Most of the world work, live, and play, where what everyone does in the city uh, is there. If you want to resolve uh, problems, it is in this area where you can resolve the, the problem. It's the world economic engine consuming most of the global power and resources and generating 80% of GDP, 70% 70, 70 of greenhouse emission. Making cities great is the critical challenge of this century. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sue, for your remarks. We're going to move to the final remarks now, and uh, this will come with a more Latin American flavor moving across the globe. So we'd like to welcome Mr. Juan to talk to us a little bit from a perspective of the Inter-American Development Bank. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, in terms of innovative instruments uh, to allow, to enable city transformation, in 2011, <clears throat> the bank launched the Emerging and Sustainable Cities Initiative. This is, in essence, uh, a technical and financial assistance program aimed at working directly with municipalities and cities. It is the bank's response to the impact, the effects, that both rapid urbanization and climate change are having in the quality of life, the medium-term sustainability, uh, and eventually the competitiveness of, of our cities, uh, its capacity to generate decent jobs, no? which at the end of the day, generating jobs is the only way in which we're going to be able to put up a good fight to reduce uh, urban inequality and, and poverty. 
uh, the program, the technical assistant component, is, is built around three dimensions, the environmental and climate change sustainability, the urban sustainability, uh, and the fiscal sustainability and governance, which is probably uh, one of the most challenging ones. Uh, the methodology that was developed back in 2010 with McKinsey and have after that been adapted and added as we learn more and more from cities <clears throat> has a sort of a multi-sectoral approach, a, a transversal sort of dimension in this integral uh, vision of what a city is. No? In its first component, we basically uh, generate a, an action plan, which is the sustainable development plan of that particular city, uh, which contains the, the interventions that have to be implemented in order to be able to improve the indicators, the sustainability indicators, and eventually improve quality of life and competitiveness, uh, the way to create uh, productive jobs. In 2013, uh, we added uh, a new vector, a new chapter uh, on the smart cities. And basically, we are trying to assist cities in their migration from a traditional way of managing the city to, to a smart way of, of managing the city. And, and we've learned so much and we learn a lot and I'm not gonna take uh, most of the time now because we wanna leave time for the Q&A questions, but there's tons of things that I could sort of <clears throat> share with you and what we learned from that migration. Uh, and it's not as easy uh, as it sounds. Um, in terms of some, some metrics and numbers, the program is in its fifth year. We have already uh, 55 cities, intermediate emerging cities, included in the program. Uh, we have partnered with local development banks in the region, strategic partnerships. We have seven of those, which have really strengthened the character of the regional public good of, of our methodology, of our program. And we have mobilized in terms of committed uh, long-term loans, uh, $4 billion, uh, 1.6 from the bank's balance sheet and the rest from our local development bank partners. No? In terms of, of the challenges no, that, that they pose, I mean, by now it is pretty clear how that instrument as, as a urban planning tool works and what are the challenges. And believe me, what we learn is that they're very similar in terms of the cities, their solution might have a geographical or a political flavor, depending where the city is, a coastal city or a city by the mountains, but the issue, the challenges in how to provide better services remain the same, in particularly on, on the fiscal management and on the governance, no? <clears throat> As I was mentioned in the introduction by Dan, obviously accessing long-term financing is the real challenge. Everybody by now knows what to do. It's just uh, how to get the resources to be able to do it, no? Our cities in average are triple B credit rating, local currency. That means that without a, a sovereign backing, it's gonna be very difficult for you to access, uh, you know, 20 year money, which is exactly what you need to be able to invest in, in the kind of interventions you need to invest to improve your sustainability. We sometimes tend to believe that um, probably if we could structure good projects, because liquidity is out there, we might have a better chance. Well, even getting the funding for the pre-investment to prepare the project so you can have something that makes sense. If it is a PPP that the source of repayment is actually robust and is there and that you know that it doesn't have any risk and this and that and the other. well. Just the pre-investment is a huge challenge for the cities. Uh, to, for them to invest a million, a million and a half dollars in preparing a project, a, a water treatment plan, a rapid bus a transit system, or what have you, I mean, they would have to really cut their budget and stop paying, you know, the t-shirts of, of the healthcare providers or the policemen. No? So it's very, 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 very difficult. Uh, but at the end, and just to, to close the remarks here and, and move into the Q&A, um, what we're learning from, as a development banks, is that probably cities is where the next battles to reduce urban inequity and poverty should be fought. I think the time of the national public policies in trying through national public policies impact the citizen is probably past and gone. We need to work closer 
to the citizens, closer to where they feel and they know what they need. No? And I mean, just recently, three weeks ago, when the new sustainable development goals were discussed in New York, goal 11 is addressing uh, exactly the cities and their quality of life, and their inclusion, and their sustainability. Even Jeffrey Sachs is already explaining this concept that, God, if the world is becoming urbanized, we better make sure that we reach the sustainable development goals at the city level, because other than that, the aggregate will not add up. So I will leave it up to that. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for those remarks. And um, we now have the opportunity and deliberately left plenty of time uh, for questions. And so I would like you, if you're feeling uh, brave enough to take the microphones, to just come to one of the mics on the left and uh, I'll ask you to take some questions. And while you summon up the courage or frame up the question, I'll just very quickly make a couple of remarks uh, on the comments of, of the panel. Um, Financing in cities uh, is the big key to unlocking the potential. And we've heard that there are many challenges uh, and there are also many opportunities as a result. And what you see here um, at this conference, uh, particularly in the realms of technology, are some of the innovations that can unlock that potential in the cities, but they clearly don't come for free. So it's about trading off, as we've heard from some of the speakers, um, the investment decisions that you have to make. What struck me particularly um, on the comments specifically about uh, Korea and um, also uh, some of the African examples is this need for efficient and well-run cities who already have stabilized their own financial infrastructure um, so that they have a platform on which they can secure the further capital they need to invest in the programs that they want. We have to trade off those programs between sustainability on the one hand, which urbanization is putting pressure on, and competitiveness on the other, competitiveness on the other hand, because as you heard, cities are the economic engine of growth and the driver of GDP. How do you do that? Well, of course, two of our colleagues here are from the finance side of the house, uh, and they've already talked a little bit, and I hope you have further questions on, how can we become more innovative through things like the uh, finance plus plus and the knowledge sharing or the public private partnerships that unload, uh, unlock other private sector money and how can they help you initiate projects because it's often the scoping and initiation process uh, that has to be the first trade-off that's made by a city leader and their cabinet uh, how could they possibly help with that so uh, I'm not seeing anybody coming to the microphones so you're either very shy still or we have a volunteer in the middle, so that's great. While you make your way over to, to the microphone, please, anybody else who wants to uh, uh, make, a, make a remark or a question? Okay, well, thank you for being first. Could I ask you just briefly to state your name and the organization you represent, and then your question to the panel, please? Okay, uh, I'm Lin from Taiwan. I'm a university professor, and now uh, I'm leading some uh, smart city projects to help disabled people to uh, improve their employment and also improve the accessibility of the city. Well, my question is actually very simple because due to the time limit, we haven't heard enough from uh, Director Leung's presentation about the ADB's um, initiative for the long-term technology to support the urban area to uh, improve their uh, cities. So is that okay that to, to, to know more from you? Thank you. That, well, thank you for the question. Um, just while you gather your thoughts, Amy, and we check the technology is working. Anybody else want to uh, get in line for a question? Uh, we'll ask you if you'd like to have a, a crack at that. What's the long-term view on technology for sustainability for access accessibility okay is there any view on that that you can share okay we um, in ADB we don't specifically have a program on that but in the overall uh, support to uh, urban development I was mentioning just now future cities program over a 15 20 year period part of that would be to support those cities that we have selected and we hope we will expand that to more than eight cities uh, to identify various aspects of urban development and one area that we we understand many cities are increasingly uh, particularly in Asia very uh, concerned about is social uh, protection and equity and 
technology to support that would definitely be one area that we need to look into. It is not a strength of ADB, so in that regard, we are looking for centers of excellence who will be able to work with us to work together with the cities. But we are going to be long-term supporting cities, and that would be definitely one aspect of making cities equitable. Sounds like an opportunity. Would anyone else on the panel like to add any remarks on that particular point while we see if there are any other questions? No? Happy to dodge that bullet. Okay, um, just while we gather up the strength for some other questions, unless we have one coming now, indeed we do. Thank you very much, sir. Your name, your organization, and your question? <coughs> My name is John Gage. I'm part of Zhuang Close's new organization called Network 11 to bring IT skills across the new challenge from goal 11. My, my question's for those cities that do have poor financing. Are there any innovative financial mechanisms in the stage of preparing adequate designs for new water systems or retrofitting existing horrible water systems that leak enormous amounts of, are there any financial mechanisms, I'm thinking in the case of Nairobi, where the city is unable to generate adequate revenues, terrible tax structure, and every time there's an initiative, many cities would try this, to regularize the money flowing to the informal transport system, perhaps by requiring everyone not to use cash but instead use a smart card. We watched that effort in Nairobi founder because the opposition of anyone that didn't have a contactless card, that is to say the credit card companies and the banks, politically killed the initiative by the governor to raise money. So what in wow. innovative financial mechanisms are you seeing evolving in bringing funds to those cities with terrible credit? Thank, thanks for the question. Do you want to go first? Thank you. Um, I mean, in terms of innovative financial instrument, I mean, one most, based on experience, I mean, at the end of the day, you need to have a secure source of repayment for that debt. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much creative you want to get. <laughs> Unless you have a source of repayment that is credible, that is believable, you're not going to be able to get the kind of tenor money you need for that investment. Having said this, we've seen uh, some creative ways of generating a value that will guarantee this repayment uh, of the debt. So for instance, we're working a lot with uh, land value capture, where the municipality owns pieces of land. W one of the most important assets that our municipalities in Latin America has, that's an inheritance of the colonial times, is land. <laughs> land that is usually not used or used for the wrong purposes, no? So we're doing a lot of urban redevelopment projects together with the private sector where the local government is investing in the infrastructure, public services, and then because once you put the public services, that land that was valued at one at that time goes to four, five, six, or seven, then we are monetizing and capturing that land value increase and using that to secure the payment of debt financing to be able to do something else. Something else we're seeing in, on, on the smart city sort of concept side, uh, which we are now kicking around the idea to translate it to Latin America. New York is in the process of actually providing the city with a 100% full Wi-Fi connected city free. And the way they're doing this is via a mechanism where they'll set up a corporation to handle the advertising, that will be a private, and through the revenues of the advertising, they can guarantee the maintenance and the expansion of the Wi-Fi infrastructure that is needed to cover Manhattan, which is a pretty uh, sizable uh, uh, place, no? So we're doing a lot of that, and, and, and I think we're learning more and more of these creative ways of creating value, because at the end, you need to create a value to be able to provide the repayment source. Smart cards, I think that's very important. When we start working, remember I was telling you about how to help cities migrate from a traditional management of cities to a smart. 
smart cards normally comes as, as a first thing. You know, smart card is basically something that you have a chip in, and then you talk to the company that ha does the software in the chip, and then you start introducing in that chip not just normal commerce payments, but you know, public transportation, parking, ticket fines, you name it. Very difficult in our cities, because that needs a, a, a connectivity infrastructure, and, and needs also a, a, a technical acumen on the part of the commercial banks. In some of our cities, it's still not there. One of the things we're doing when we're trying to help them migrate is, that, hey guys, start for things that are a lot more easier and that have a lot more impact. For instance, in our case, in Latin America, I'm pretty sure it's also the case in Africa, in our intermediate cities, I mean, not the Rio Janeiro's and the Mexico's and the Buenos Aires, but the intermediate cities, it's still like three quarters, 75% of the citizen services, a license, a marriage license, a car license, uh, payment of taxes, whatever, are done manually. The guy has to go into the municipality, into the ayuntamiento, into the main office, and that's his service. It still uses carbon copies. You know, the original, and then eight color copies, and then you ask them, what do you do with the eight color copies? Oh, no, they're sitting there someplace, creating a hazard and fire risk in some warehouse. And we tell them, listen, the first step in smart city is digitalize that. I mean, you don't need you know, rocket science. Those are software that exist, that are out there, and all you need is to assemble a team, have you know, the proper hardware, and digitalize those services. Property tax. We, in Latin America, collect one six, and this is a good research of what the OECD countries, countries like Spain and Europe, collect in property taxes. Because we have outdated systems, uh, we do it manually, most of the cases, and so on. With the technology today, a property registration using your reference techniques, you could almost have it online. And you would know when the guy is building a pool, and then you need you know, to charge more because he's building a pool. A, collection of the property tax. All that is out there. And it's not multi-millionaire investments. These are just hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the impact that it would have on the municipality, is it will triple or quadruple the income via the property taxes. No? So those are the kinds of smart things we're doing at, at the very beginning, until you get to the smart card, which is kind of at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to say anything else? Please, please yeah. go ahead. Yes, you can clap, by the way. <laughs> if you like the answer, it's permissible to applaud. Thank you. I just want to share with you uh, similar thoughts. Uh, I think Africa uh, is not known for to be so much connected as uh, it is. 600, 000, 600 million smartphones in, in Africa, bigger, more than in European Union, more than in the USA. And, and people don't even have a fixed line. Eh? They don't even have a fixed line, but they do have a smartphone. And they do a lot of things. Uh, you spoke of Nairobi, uh, uh, the earlier gentleman. Like M-Pesa is mobile banking and mobile money. Number one in the world is from Kenya. And, and uh, Uganda is doing e-health and instead of uh, because people ca cannot travel 200 kilometers to go to a, a dispensary or a health center, so they do a health uh, caring at a distance and for simple cases and that avoid a lot of people going to the city and and traveling uh, a, a whole distance, and um, they even sell their their agricultural crop by mobile phone. Uh, and they, they get weather information again for the agriculture through mobile phone. All this a simple, no investment at all, just a simple uh, tool is changing lives of millions of people in Africa. It's a simple thing. But this is being done because uh, when you, you are uh, at a survival level, you have to be innovative. And they have done it by themselves, without the city, without the government. It's all private people doing. I even know one last um, uh, application invented by a Kenyan lady is called iCow. She, has, she is a farmer who owns a number of cows. She has tagged the ear of each of her cows with a chip and she can know what time is best to milk the cow, what time is best if a cow is sick, 
and she is now selling the application worldwide. And, and this is the case of invention we are uh, uh, witnessing because of the survival environment and uh, the, the outcome of IT today in, in the world. Amy. Um, in Asia, I think um, many of the cities, or there are very, very developed cities like the Beijing and Shanghai in China, but there are many, many cities who are still at, almost at the very early stage of developing into smart cities. I mean, many, most people, like in India, I, I was told I, am, I don't cover India. Many, almost everyone, want to own a mobile phone, but they don't want to have a toilet. They would rather spend the money to buy a phone, which makes them maybe look really smart, but they cannot, you know, do the business in a covered in a, with dignity because that is more important. So in a way to build and, and to help our clients develop a city, I think we, are, we need creative financing. We need to convince the government as well as the citizens that it is, that it is not always going into the super high tech. Sometimes you do need the technology. They are low technology, very low cost uh, sanitation facilities that one can use. And it could be connected through the, uh, you know, the new IT system that we can, almost, we can recycle many of the waste to energy. To so in terms of financing, creative financing, one aspect that we have been encouraging our clients is there's three, three, three revenue sources. One is transfer, the other is tax, and the other is tariff. Now, we have been working very, very closely with our clients to improve the way of in increasing their revenue, particularly through tariff, and also revenue, for example, waste to energy that they can actually recycle and generate more revenue to reinvest all of that to build uh, basic infrastructure and services that the citizens can benefit. Until everybody have equal, uh, have full service or ac full access to all these basic services, then I think we can then move on to the more smart technology. I mean, it's not to say that they're not important, they are very important, but different cities have different level of development, and I think we need to uh, look into different contexts and then identify what kind of creative financing or creative technology that, that we can provide for them. No, thank you. Okay. I don't see any other volunteers for questions at the moment. Do we have somebody? Yes, please. Oh, lovely. And you are? And from? I'm Raquel from Brazil. Uh, it's for Juan. Uh, he talked about a urban plan tool that was developed uh, to identify what the city needs to do to, to improve. Uh, and my question is, is this available for all cities and how we can get that? Two aspects. Two aspects to, to your question, no? One is the methodology available no? in which this Emerging Sustainable Cities Initiative, uh, in order to be able to apply it, the answer is yes, it's on, it's on our web. And, and even every update we do, we've done already three editions, every update we do, it's, it's, it's there in, in the web. You can download it. Second aspect of the question, I mean, to implement the methodology, you need the funding. No, the funding is the part that is, is, is it's not that it's, I mean, it's only available on the basis of our relationships in the country. So in Brazil, we work with Caixa Economica. Caixa Economica is our partner, no? And so we implement the program through them. We already have five cities in Brazil. And well, because the situation in the country today, we are waiting a little bit now to expand the program in 2016. Did you want to add to that briefly or not? Okay, thanks for the question from Brazil. Um, any other questions coming up? Hello. Uh, good morning, it's Balashiva from Bureau Hapold. Um, I was just, um, I wanted to ask a question about, uh, to, to the funders really, in how you can manage to get the cities or get your clients as governments or cities to really do the kind of things that they should be doing. Because looking at the many projects that are being funded by the World Bank and other organizations, uh, they don't necessarily seem to be in a logical order, in a strategic way to, to actually respond to, to what the city needs. So just when you're a parent and you're giving money to your children, you're not giving for this and that and that, but you give them to like get a driving license and then they could get a car, not first to get the car and then, then another car and then, then a driving license. So I was wondering how you can, how you can encourage that kind of behavior. Would you, anybody want to take that one? 
You take it. Yes, I'm just saying, Amy, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I, I, I will start with, uh, with, with this one. I fully agree. I totally agree with you. When I first started in ADB about 16 years ago, I was doing urban projects in um, Uzbekistan. That was, a, that was a good one. We started with water supply. And then I moved to the China program, and I was uh, given a project to process in China in the medium-sized cities. And the project was very strange. It was like a little stretch of a road there, a water treatment plant here, and a flood management in another part of the city. I have no idea why I'm doing all these little bits and pieces of the program. I went to talk to the government, and we were saying, well, we have a very good master plan already, so we just want you to finance those. So I did that. I was, I was too young to question. Along the way, luckily, <laughs> trying to develop very fast, and they do know what they are doing, so it turns out to be okay. It was, it was successful. But we have learned in some other less developed countries, we do need to have better planning and a better uh, city development strategy before we should come in with the finance. And that is exactly what we have been doing in the last 10 years, that before we put our money to design the project, we want to make sure that the city would have a proper development strategy. So very often we will be using our partners' trust fund to help develop those strategies. They don't have one. And if they do have one, we want to make sure that we will help to refine and to make sure that they set the right objective and targets. And nowadays, um, most cities, they are much more advanced than maybe 20 years ago. They do know where they want to be. They have their vision and they have their strategy. But sometimes it's developing a city, growing a city is complex. It involves many, many sectors. So it's prioritizing which goes first. And this is an area I think uh, us, IADB and the World Bank can come in and, and our partners can also do better. And then we have recently done a very interesting project in Vietnam. It is, we call the Green Cities Initiative, in which the Vietnam government asked ADB to come and support the green growth strategy. It's a national strategy and then it just, you know, they go down to the local government and say, now, please implement green growth strategy. So many cities' government have no idea what they're talking about. So what exactly is green growth? At a city level, they're particularly lost. So they came to ADB, and this is that we, we need to do green growth, so please help us. Now, we covered three cities. Uh, one is Hue. Hue is a very nice, beautiful UNESCO uh, city in Vietnam. They have some kind of a strategy, but they don't really know how to make it green. So we work with them, we, def we help to identify, assess the different sectors, set indicators, including low carbon, including energy efficiency, including water, um, uh, non-revenue water reduction and all that. And we come up with a very nice program as to you know, where they should head and achieve in 20 years. And with that, we also help them identify, develop short, medium and long-term investment program. And ADB start with a short-term program to invest in some basic infrastructure. I think that is the best way for us to do, and we hope we will continue to do that for all our future projects. It's not always possible, but this is where we want to head. It, what we're seeing is that the bank has on lend to cities since its inception, no? with sovereign guarantees always. Now, since uh, the, this program that I'm managing has been maturing, what we're seeing is that countries, not the bank, the countries, are telling the bank, listen, let's do the city lending program through the Emerging and Sustainable Cities program after the action plan is made. Because it's providing exactly what you're saying. It's providing this integral vision of the city and that prioritization. I mean, what are the highest impact investments here? And so countries like Mexico, like Colombia, like Brazil, like Argentina, we are on lending through the cities program. Thanks very much. We're out of time for any more formal questions because I am under instruction to close on time for those of you who had other meetings or for lunch. However, our panelists will stay around, so if you were not quick enough or too shy, please come up the front at the end. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for your attention, and please can I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>